Okay, welcome to the fourth annual Authors and Artists Festival Rewilding. For those of you just joining us, my name is Liz Burton Crow and I'm your host from Nature Culture. Our sponsors include the New England Grassroots Environment Fund, Mary King, Kathy Cremens, and Rescue Poetics. The festival is brought to you with help from my video production company, The Nature Imaginarium, Human Era Publishing, and Score.org. Thank you to our sponsors, our colleagues, all our presenters, and to you for being here. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to John Cannon. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. So hi, uh, I'm, uh, I'm John Cannon, and I am a, an environmental lawyer by training. Um, and uh, a fan of nature writing by avocation. So I'm going to try to put these two things together, which aren't necessarily an easy thing to do. So by way of introduction, I've spent my life practicing environmental law, working with uh, federal agencies like the EPA, and also teaching environmental law at a, at a, at a law school. But all through that time, uh, I've been an avid reader of nature writers from John Muir to Robin Kimmerer and many in between. And the question that prompted me to offer this talk today and to engage you is what is the relationship between these two realms? What is the relationship of literature that invites us to see and value the environment and the realm of law and policy that seeks to protect it? Uh, it's a question that I've thought about often. I have no good answer to it, but I'm hopeful today that uh, we can engage in some discussion about it. So poets have different views about this topic. Um, Shelley, uh, who was sometimes listed among nature writers, uh, a 19th century English poet, said this, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind. Uh, what did he mean by that? Uh, what kind of activity flows from reading a poetry a poet uh, that would justify this kind of claim. Robert Haas has a more skeptical view of the political salience of nature writing. Um, he wrote, poetry proposes no solutions. Uh, taking Haas's view for a moment, it would be very unlikely that a congressman or a senator would call up a poet, even a poet so distinguished as Robert Haas and say, uh, what should I do about this piece of environmental legislation? What should be our policy? So the realms of politics and poetry seem quite different and always have to me in some ways, but maybe not so different as it might seem on the face of it. And my question really is, can both of these poets be right? So what is nature writing? Um, I'm going to I'm going to talk uh, about nature writing, and then I'm going to talk about some some categories of nature writing, and then I'm going to talk about the writing itself and what we might look to by way of effective nature writing in this venue. So I take my definition from no less an authority than Wikipedia. Nature writing is nonfiction or fiction, prose or poetry about the natural environment. And it includes all these things, natural history, essays, poetry, essays of solitude or escape, as well as travel and adventure writing. Nature writing can be largely observational. Gilbert White, the 18th century writer, uh, wrote about the nature around his village in, in England, Selborn, and he documented the lives of hedgehogs and other animals. It was uh, close to a kind of a botanical inventory really of his environment. But nature writing can also be visionary. Gary Snyder's Turtle Island draws on images from nature and Buddhist and Native American beliefs and is, is an invitation to re-inhabit the North American continent in a way quite different from the way that we had developed it. So observational, visionary, 
many things in between. Just to put some, some categories out there for consideration, one of the things that, that nature writing does is describe Gilbert White's work, for example. Another thing it does is celebrate, and sometimes it does both of those things together, or does one of those things celebrate after a careful description. Annie Dillard, um, who wrote Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek, has a nice summation of the importance of description in nature writing. It's to, to look at the whole landscape, really see it, she says, and describe what's going on there. And then after we've seen it, we can wail the right question into the swaddling band of darkness, or if it comes to that, fire the proper praise. Dillard's own ferocious search for God in the closely observed uh, world of Tinker Creek becomes a meditation on life and death and redemption in nature. John Muir's Mountains of California has a detailed description of trees that goes on for some pages, trees of various kinds, their leaves, their height, their bark. It's, it's a, a, a botanical rehearsal. And then after that kind of description, we come to a, an episode in a tumultuous windstorm where Muir climbs to the top of a hundred foot, foot spruce tree and flails around in the storm for hours like a bobolink on a reed, as he says. And after that wild ex ecstasy, he descends into a calm, uh, tranquil forest, which the sun fills with an amber light. And there's a kind of a, a blessing that flows from that moment. So we have a, 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 a different roles of description and also different kinds of celebrations. The celebrations don't have to be blustery like Muir's. They can be subtle and quiet, but no less affecting. Uh, they can celebrate the commonplace rather than su the sublime, which is what Muir's ride in the treetop is really all about. Um, an example of that, this is a poem you'll be familiar with from uh, your school days, uh, Pied Beauty by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Uh, I'm just going to read it uh, because it's the sound is so beautiful. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose bowls all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings. Landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. So rather than the windstorm in the forest and the grand beauty of the Sierra Nevada, as in Muir's account, this poem celebrates the commonplace things, vivid, variegated, paradoxical things, the bicolored sky, like a, like a multicolored cow, the trout stippled with uh, rose moles, Chestnuts broken out of their husks, orange like burning coals, but also perhaps destined for roasting. Um, the variegated landscape, the work by who, work by humans, and part part of the beauty. Implements of trade. Nature here is not just wild nature; it's domesticated nature and human endeavor within that nature. The poem evokes the distinctiveness of all these things, but also their unity, and ends with this beautiful. Uh, last couple of lines, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. God becomes the, the unity, the unchanging source of all this variety. Praise him. So again, we have the movement from description to praise that, um, that we saw earlier and uh, a, a, a beautiful uh, kind of closure with that last short line. 
We see something different going on in a poem by Mary Oliver, uh, but perhaps to the end of, perhaps in the end uh, to similar effect. Uh, here's the Hermit Crab by her. I'm gonna give you a, a minute just to read it. You may not have seen it before and it may be helpful just to let you read it before I chime in. The Hermit Crab. Once I looked inside the darkness of a shell, folded like a pastry, and there was a fancy face, or almost a face. It turned away and frisked up its brawny forearm so quickly against the light, and my looking in, I scarcely had time to see it gleaming. So here we have something quite different from uh, Hopkins. We have instead of a, 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 a look at a whole landscape of things, a whole world of things really in their varied beauty. Mary Oliver here is focusing in on one thing, but finding a lot to see there. Something that begins as a dark thing, looked inside the darkness of the shell, but sees a fancy face, something that's almost a face, something that beckons to her, that she recognizes, that calls her attention. And it protects itself, frisks, frisks up its brawny forearms against the light and her own intrusion. So she hardly has time to see it, but she does see it, that moment. And the last word gleaming captures that, a moment of a kind of joyous revelation here. Uh, so we see this thing intensely in its beauty, despite its small size and its defensiveness. And that it is itself a kind of, of uh, exaltation, although not the, the writing on the top of the tree that we saw with Muir. So nature writing acquaints us or reacquaints us with the wonder around us. It reconnects us to the nature outside and our own nature. It helps us know nature in fresh new ways. And maybe that's enough to reveal, to celebrate, uh, to, to paraphrase the Senegalese forester, Bobby Dayum, we protect what we love and we love what we know. And this kind of poetry helps us know the world in a way that would lead us to love it. And we, we assume protect it as well. But nature writing often goes beyond description and celebration to diagnosis and remedies, sort of inter intercedes in more direct ways to try to uh, get our attention to problems in the, in, the, in the natural world and to potential solutions. Um, and this brings us to diagnoses and prescriptions in nature writing. Robert Haas again has a, has a, um, a rather skeptical view of, of this. There are rare poems that have things to say about politics that are permanently smart and useful. Uh, and we may disagree with him about that, uh, but that still leaves room for prose. And there's plenty of nature writing in the form of prose that does take on this role of diagnosis and prescription. I wanna separate these two categories uh, for purposes of, dis of discussion and focus, uh, focus particularly or at first on diagnoses. Um, Poetry may not be very good at policy prescriptions or political discourse, but it can be very good at diagnoses, displaying vividly the problems we're creating in the natural world. Um, here's an example, I think, of that. Uh, a poem by Jay Perini, Some Effects of Global Warming in Lackawanna, Lackawanna County, which is uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and I'll give you a moment just to read it on your own before I chime in. Some effects of global warming in Lackawanna County. 
The maples sweat now, out of season. Buds pop eyes in wintry bushes as the birds arrive, not having checked the calendars or clocks. They scramble in the frost for seeds, while underground a sobbing starts in roots and tubers. Ice cracks easily along the bank. It, it slides in gullies where a bear, still groggy, steps through coiled wire of the weeds. Kids in t-shirts run to school, unaware that summer is a long way off. Their teachers flirt with off-the-wall assignments, drum their fingers on the sweaty desktops. As for me, my heart leaps high, a deer escaping from the crosshairs skipping over barely frozen water as the surface bends and splinters underfoot. So the poem's about an unnaturally early spring, of course, and you see these wonderful images of contradiction, maples sweating out of season, buds popping on wintry bushes, birds arriving according to their own experience of the temperature, but out of sync with calendars and clocks kids going to school in t-shirts because it's warm, but summer is a long way off. Summer, at least as officially declared rather than determined by the actual circumstances. And there are the teachers flirting with off the wall assignments and drumming their fingers on the sweaty desktops. They're, they're giddy too and impatient because the weather, the the, the temperature is telling them it's time to be done. Uh, and then you have this last section with the with the speaker. As for me, my heart leaps high. That actually may be an echo of Wordsworth. My heart leaps up. A deer escaping from the crosshairs, skipping over barely frozen water as the surface bends and splinters underfoot. So you see this final image after all these sort of dissonances between the weather and the, the calendar and the clocks and the expectations. Uh, this image of escape, of trying not to fall through the ice, the deer escaping from the crosshairs from being hunted, but also trying not to fall into the water uh, through the thin ice, a sense of, a, a sense of danger and, and uh, risk. So what I admire about this is the specificity. Climate change is not detectable by ordinary people in ordinary places. It goes on too slowly. It can only be measured by instruments over long periods of time. But what this poem does imaginatively is capture the sense of that in a place so that it, 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 it offers an image of something that's very hard for human beings to grasp. And therefore, I think itself is a contribution to civic understanding. It doesn't talk about climate change. The only place you see climate change or global warming is in the title. And it doesn't have a prescription. But it does, it does create a sense that I think stays with the reader and might communicate through a community of readers that climate change is real and will have consequences of of this sort over time. Other works not only identify the abuse, but take it head on and urge a solution or a corrective action to be taken. This doesn't happen uh, often in poems, as we've noted, but it does happen often in prose. Uh, I've, I've just set forth here some, some works, some canonical works uh, that do exactly this. Um, Terry Tempest Williams in Refuge. Um, that book is a hymn to her home country of, of the Great Salt Lake and its environment. It's also a, 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 a memoir of, his, of her family life. But finally, and perhaps ultimately, it is a screed against nuclear tests that were conducted, being conducted in Nevada and having fallout crossover into Utah. And that fallout, Williams argued, had caused a, a, a cross-generational instances of breast cancer in the women of her family. 
And the book ends with her trespassing onto a government test site, not just talking about it, but doing something about it and being arrested in protest of continued nuclear testing. So the book expresses her activism. It, it documents her activism and the reasons for it. Um, Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring is a scientific story about the effects of chemical pesticides on living creatures, particularly on birds higher up the food chain, like all eagles and osprey. It was written to reach a pop popular audience and it used imagery like the title, Silent Spring, as an image in itself, a very powerful one uh, that attracted popular attention. And when it was published, it had a, it had a, a, a monumental effect on the public's feelings or perceptions about the risks of chemicals in the environment, led to the banning of DDT. And many people argue, and I, I believe that this book, Silent Spring, really began the modern environmental movement with all the, the change that has accompanied that. It changed history. Um, Edward Abbey's uh, writing has a strong current of uh, resistance to development, road development, dam development, other developments that he thought were degrading the, the beauty of the Western lands that he loved so much, the canyon lands. Monkey Wrench Gang is a, is a good example of that which records the exploits of a motley band of eco saboteurs who have plans to blow up the Glen Canyon Dam and do a lot of other uh, monkey wrenching with developmental projects. And here the, the example is of, of fiction as a form of nature writing and of uh, advocacy through the model of the characters in this book to resist the kind of development that Abby found so disconcerting. Uh, and finally, Aldo Leopold, the book that almost everyone in the environmental world is familiar with and has read and many have taken to heart. It's part memoir about a, the restoration of a depleted Wisconsin farm and partly a philosophical reflection on how we treat the land here, here uh, Leopold puts out the, the famous land ethic, urging us to see ourselves as members and citizens of the biotic community, along with soil and plants and waters and uh, water and wildlife, instead of just acting as masters of it. He did not urge any specific action. He had no policy proposal. He wanted us to internalize a new ethic that he thought responded to the abuse of the past. Did he achieve a result? Maybe it's hard to know, but maybe we'll hear your views about that later on. So with some of these uh, writers, you can discern the direct causal links from, from some pieces of nature writing to pro-environmental policy changes. Silent Spring is probably the prime example of that. The book created a huge wave of public awareness, Advocates picked it up and institutions responded. EPA, for example, canceled DDT, the pesticide that was most of concern to, to, uh, to Rachel Carson. Uh, we've been waiting for a, for a silent spring on climate change, something that would galvanize response the way her book did around pesticides. Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, perhaps as a candidate, but that book and others sounding the alarm on climate change really have left us more polarized than ever. Often the causal linkage, if you can trace one at all, is attenuated. Here's Robert Haas's trickle down theory of the national park system, uh, which begins with the German romantics uh, who influenced Wordsworth who influenced Thoreau, Thoreau would not have written without Wordsworth, who influenced Muir, who would not have written without uh, Thoreau, at least not the way he did. And Muir was very active through his writing and 
directly in establishing the national parks. The first national park was this, you know, was Yosemite, which was in Muir's stopping, stomping ground in the Sierra Nevadas. And Muir also advocated for establishing other parks and protecting forested lands. Um, and there just and there may be no causal links. It may be impossible to 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 link even the best nature writing to any particular uh, cultural change or political event. Um, how would you know whether the whether the land ethic proposed in Sand County and the Sand County Almanac were the moting, motivating force behind a particular policy or a particular measure? But maybe it's the motivating force behind many. It's just hard to know. Nature writers also have uh, uh, recorded some uh, failures just to balance the record. Um, John Muir was very much opposed to the damming of the Hetch Hetchy Valley, which was planned to provide a water supply to, to a burgeoning San Francisco. Uh, and he wrote about it. He wrote a famous essay about the Hetch Hetchy Valley, which contains this ringing sentence, damn Hetch Hetchy, as well as damn for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, where no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. Um, and notice here, we've seen this in other writers we talked about today, the use of religious imagery to, uh, to capture the sense of the sacred, the sense of the holy that we often feel in nature. Um, Muir uses that often. He went beyond essay writing to lobby President Roosevelt to oppose the dam, but the dam was built. Here's a, a, a before and after. Uh, 175 feet of the valley were, were flooded and remain flooded today. So, should should we what should we think about eco evangelism? What should, should nature writing should a goal of nature writing be to bring about change? Um, some nature writers uh, like Gary Snyder, who's written a lot about change and advocated a lot of changes, feel that um, their venture hasn't necessarily borne fruit, as he says. It's not particularly gratifying to have been right when the world seems to have gone in a much different direction than was advocated. Um, and if we decide we want to move the needle, if we if we think our writing should be about change, um, how do we go about it? Um, how do we avoid, for example, preaching to the converted? Or how do we reach out to audiences that may, that may not share our values and perspectives, but will have to be included in any kind of collective resolution. Um, and one way to think about writing, any writing is story and voice uh, and nature writers who would plan or might wish to, to achieve change or bring about change would have to pay attention to both, of course. Jonathan Franzen says, everyone, believer and non-believer alike, enjoys a good story. And so it seems to me that the first rule of evangelical nature writing should be tell one. And of course, you want to tell the story well in order to be effective. Um, I mean, the story can be a simple one, out and back along a favorite hike, something happening along the way, but it needs to have some compelling feature, something that makes the reader want to keep on reading, and it needs to be told well, which directs attention to the voice, the style in which the story is told. Most of us, aspiring nature writers and established nature writers too, stick pretty much to who we are. We write about what we know, what we've experienced, we reflexively write in the first person, which has some risks, particularly if you're trying to reach people who don't share your views and passions. Um, Franson has this, this to say about the I in nature writing. 
Avoiding the implication of admire me or envy me requires more attention to one's tone of written notice than one might guess. He's talking about here about the folks who, who feature their activities in nature as if those were models and something to uh, sort of uh, uh, aggrandize their own um, persona. Unlike the evangelist who rings doorbells and beatifically declares that he's been saved, the tonally challenged nature writer can't see the doors being shut in his face, but the doors are there and unconverted readers are shutting them. So what I wanted to do was leave some examples of recent writers who have handled the first person well. These are all first person narratives. That is folks, authors who have made compelling stories of their experience and managed the ways managed to, 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 to use the eye in ways that attract readers rather than turn readers off. They're diverse both in um, voice and in the nature they write about. Another interesting thing about these writers is that they come from diverse backgrounds. They are not the typical white guy going out into the high mountains and having a sublime experience. They are diverse people who have much different experiences in much different kinds of nature. And, and, and therefore they're expanding the domain of nature writing and increasing the audience that actually might be interested in reading it. Um, for example, Drew Lanham's uh, book, The Home Place is about a, a black man growing up in South Carolina in the farm country and his love for the land and his passion for birding, which leads him to become a, a distinguished ornithologist at Clemson. And this is his story. And it's a compelling story. His nature is not wilderness. It's the nature of the rural South with all of the racial overlay and cultural um, uh, difficulties of that place. But he does a wonderful job of of explicating that and drawing you into the to the to the love that he has for that place, uh, notwithstanding. Uh, Aftershocks by Nadia Awusu, who is the biracial child of a Ghanaian diplomat and uh, the descendant of, of uh, a, a Near Eastern woman. Her story is one about finding herself and where she belongs. It's the connection between placemaking and identity. Nature's both inside and outside, and the challenge is finding them, the match. So a much different take on what, what we're talking about when we're talking about nature and how the, the inner and outer relate either, either in opposition or in consonance. Um, Francisco Cantu is the grandson of Mexican in immigrants. He takes a job. Again, this is a, a story told in the I form based on experience that has actually happened, creative nonfiction. He takes a job with the US Border Patrol policing illegal crossings of the Rio Grande. And nature here is the river. As, as degraded and spoiled in places as it is, and the heavy cultural and political overlay that goes with it. And he does a, a wonderful job of, of, of expressing the concerns and cultural complexities of the situation, as well as his love for the, for the country through which the river flows. And then finally, a Amy Irvine, who is a native of uh, the the Southwest uh, and lover of the desert, like Edward Abbey. Her book is a sustained imagine, because Edward Abbey is dead, a sustained imagined conversation with Edward Abbey, uh, in which she alternatively criticizes him for his sexism and his misanthropy and his general boorishness, but also enjoys with him a love with a love for the desert country that they both uh, were involved in. Um, again, her 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 nature is is the south the Southwest desert country. 
uh, as was Edward Abbey's, but she comes to it from, from a different value perspective and with a different set of, of lessons that she would offer uh, to her readers. Um, she's a, she, this is a very powerful voice and a very funny book. And she, she received some criticism from Edward Abbey fans for publishing it, but I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a great addition to the natural, to the nature writing literature. And it actually helps redeem Edward Abbey from some of his own faults for modern audiences. There are plenty of others I could have put here. Robin Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass would be the prime candidate, a book with its roots in Native American culture and practice, emphasizing food and our relationship to food. Um, so the, the, the list goes on. And, and the, 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 this expansion and diversification of nature writing, I think is very healthy. I think it allows the, the the work of these authors to read to reach broader audiences and build more understanding across different cultural subsets for uh, the importance of protecting nature. So, um, here are the three questions that uh, I've moved through um, with the fourth, and I put them here just to encourage you. Uh, to to ask questions, make comments. Um, you can use the Q and A feature on the on the screen there that you have. Um, whether it's a comment about what nature writing is or what it ought to be, uh, whether it can actually be effective in changing culture and how that happens, and if if you think if you think nature writing should be a change agent, or one of its functions should be as a change agent. Uh, what are the most effective ways of encouraging change? And then I've added a fourth question here, and that's really to call the question of whether nature writers should care about this. I mean, maybe the job of nature writers is to write nature, to describe it, to express joy in it, to express the beauty of it, to encourage love of it, and not worry about uh, the ways to solve particular problems that they may see. Um, that's an important. That's a question I think by itself, and I'd welcome any suggestions or thoughts or questions you may have about it. Thank you, uh, John. Um, so uh, as John mentioned, you can type your questions in the Q&A um, option below. It's similar to chat, but um, specific for these webinars um, for the Q&A. So um, the other thing that you can do is you can raise your hand. And while folks are coming up with questions, um, I did have one um, that sort of speaks to that last slide that you had in terms of um, what makes nature writing effective. Um, so earlier, I, I heard you mention Al Gore's book, An Inconvenient Truth, and of course, I remember when that came out, I think it was the early 2000s, and of yeah. course, we see today not a ton has changed, unfortunately, despite the size of his platform and, you know, the the breadth at which that book was distributed and read by people, and a criticism that I've heard is that, um, one of the things that they didn't really do is allow people to process the grief that came out of that book. And I think that there was a film associated with it around the same time. And so I'm wondering if, uh, you know, if you sort of have insights as to how um, people can sort of hold that container of grief in a way that's not paralyzing, where they can then move towards action. And as a follow-up question, do you think poetry can somehow do that in a way that, that writing um, traditionally can't? No, so the, uh, both great questions. Um, I, th I think, I mean, I'm a fan of Al Gore's and I'm a fan of Inconvenient Truth. I think part of the problem with Inconvenient Truth is that it was written by a political figure who was identified with a political party and had been active in politics. And I think that if, the, if, if, if eco-evangelism or whatever we would call it requires reaching across and finding new audiences. I think that fact about Inconvenient Truth made it difficult for it to be successful in that particular way. 
um, and um, whether poetry can be uh, effective in doing that. I mean, the Perini poem we looked at, I thought, I mean, I'd never seen that before until I was preparing for this and I came across it. And I thought it did a great job, at least of, of bringing home the problem. Um, climate change is so abstract. That is, it, you know, it happens because of things that are going all on all over the globe. It's not something that any individual can do anything about in his or her own actions. I mean, the United States, even if it got its act together and had a robust climate change, greenhouse gas emission reduction program, wouldn't be able to solve the problem. It takes uh, uh, the world community. And the, and the harms happen over such a long time frame and are so incremental and so difficult to detect that it's a hard thing for people, you know, those of us who evolved to live in the world today, it's a hard thing for people to get their minds around so that any piece of literature, and I thought the Perini poem does this, any piece of literature that can actually bring that reality uh, into focus and make it real to people um, is, is doing a good job. Whether poetry should then go on to say we need to re-engineer the grid and we'll need more X more solar panels and so forth. I'm not that's not really the 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 realm of poetry, but it can certainly provide some improvement in perceiving the problem, grasping the problem, and motivating people to take the next step, I believe. Um, Thank you um for those insights and and yeah, I had never really thought about the fact that it was already politicized. I mean, it seems obvious since it is Al Gore, but um, that right. it may have been that some people were just already um, prejudging it and not necessarily um, open to the message. Um, I mean, so I think it, I mean, your, your question and the whole issue raises the, the issue whether um, nature writing has or can have a broad appeal. I mean, I don't. I I don't know, you know, who reads John Muir anymore. I don't know who reads, um, um, you know, Nadia Ousu. But I'm guessing that those are people who are of a certain sort of cultural bent. And if the idea is to bring more people in to create more uh, consensus within the culture about the value of nature and the need to do things to protect it. Um, I, I'm, I, 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 think, I think there has to be a, in some way a kind of a revolution in, in nature writing or a revolution in how we go about expressing these messages. Like Gary Snyder says, it's not enough to be right when it's clear things are going wrong in a direction that you tried to prevent. You gotta do something, find some way to redirect the action, if that's, again, if that's a function of nature writing. Thank you. Um, we do have a, a question, looks like a two-part question in the Q&A. Uh, so it's, do you have thoughts about giving more than human species voice and the challenge of not anthropomorphizing? And then also a request for further thoughts about decentering human voices in writing to lift up voice of earth and more than human species. Yeah, so the, uh, uh, those are great questions. Um, so the giving voice to human to non-human species is a great. I, I think it's a great idea. I think species, uh, you know, have a, a, that non-human life has rights. That there is a justice that extends to non-human life, and right now our legal system really isn't very good at all at addressing this. Some other. Some other countries have adopted constitutions that would uh, give give standing, legal standing, and some legal protection to species. We have a law, the Endangered Species Act, but that is designed to protect species for human benefit, right? It doesn't give species the right to appear in court on their own behalf and protect their interests. Um, there was a famous case in which Justice Douglas, who was then on the court, wrote a dissent that said that species, rivers, other natural systems should have the right to enter court, to come to court uh, on their own behalf. Uh, but 
that was a minority, a distinct minority view on the court, and it has never gained traction since then. I think that the 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 question becomes if you say species must be able to speak for themselves, they have their own rights, they have their own entitlements, and those have to be recognized in the public realm. Who speaks then for the species? It has to be a human because the species can't speak for itself. It has to be a human. So which humans get selected to do that? And um, that that would be something that would have to be worked through, but uh, it would be a welcome problem if we got to that point where um, where that were really an issue. It sounds like some of these limitations are with the American justice system. I'm, I'm thinking of a couple examples, I think from New Zealand, where they have a river or or that um, was recognized as like a legal right. entity with rights. Yes, right. So there are examples in different countries. I was curious, um, since I don't see anything new in the Q&A, um, if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, like so I think that's a great idea. And some countries have tried it. And I think what the legal, how the legal system handles the question that I just raised about who speaks for the river. They have a system where the river is uh, appointed a guardian. The court decides based on whatever criteria are before it um, that a person or a group can speak for the river or should speak for the river and is entitled to represent the interests of that river. Um, I mean, you know, that, that in a way, there, there's some anthropomorphizing that goes on there. That is, we can't be the river. Um, we can't, maybe we can't think like the river, but we have to come as close to that as we can. There's a, there's a famous essay by Aldo Leopold, Thinking Like a Mountain. <laughs> that's, that's an exercise he goes through when he's, coming to terms with his own um, uh, history of hunting wolves. And what he what he realizes or what he comes to realize in the uh, essay is that the mountain ecosystem, that's really what he's talking about, encompasses wolves, that wolves belong in that ecosystem. And that if you take yourself out of your human, you know, protect the, the game or eliminate uh, predators thinking, and you think like a mountain, like the system, you'll understand that the wolves belong there as well as the other lives. So I think we 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 should take steps. It wouldn't be easy, but we should take steps to inst institutionalize that notion of somebody representing a natural system and coming as close as we can to uh, understanding the the full breadth and identity of that system. Do you have any thoughts as to, you know, sort of who would be the one to start that? Like I know, for example, with, you know, species conservation efforts, it's often begins with what they call the charismatic species, right? Yeah, like the, right. the elephants and the whales and, and, and whatnot, or panda bears. Um, is there sort of an example of a natural system that you think um, raises to the fore in terms of um, not only being like known across the country, but maybe having an issue that should be raised in the courts? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the Northwest forests, uh, which were an issue and still are an issue, the old growth forests in the Northwest presented an interesting example, I think, of what you're talking about. Where um, where a species of owl who that was endangered inhabited these forests, and um, and there was an effort required by the Endangered Species Act to protect that owl and its habitat, but that was used as an effort more broadly to protect the old growth ecosystem. And I think that's one of the criticisms of the Endangered Species Act is it focuses on individual species rather than ecosystems. And many argue that it's what we should protect are different ecosystem types rather than individual species, because it's the ecosystem where evolution occurs, change occurs, natural variation occurs, and so forth. And that's what keeps the whole uh, 
collection of life uh, healthy rather than the existence of one species. But species can be a kind of a harbinger or a, a bellwether in a way that uh, makes them useful for ecosystem protection. Uh, but why not have a why not have a a recognition of the of the northwest old growth forest as an ecosystem that should have its own voice. Thank you. Um, but like we it, do have a it, hand up from Janet. Um, Janet, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Well, I actually wrote a response in the Q and A or in the Q and A, which was just struggling with. Um, the non writing from the non human world, because as part of a workshop with Nicole Brown, we um, were focused on writing from the non human perspective. And I wrote a poem about chickadees, birds I knew nothing about. And yeah. um, I was trying to balance between writing something that was understandable to human beings and yet trying somehow to imitate what it was like to be a chickadee. Like to yeah. imitate the calls or to understand their lifespans or what it would be like to only live for two years. And so, you know, it didn't work totally well either way. But really what I'm thinking about is if you don't anthropomorphize a little bit enough for other humans to see that a creature is lovable. Oh, this creature is a mother. This creature is a yada. You know, I don't know how far we're going to get. So I'm... I'm struggling with it. Yeah, I thought so. I, I could sympathize with this. I mean, look, we're human beings. Um, we can't not be human beings. We can have whatever insights or empathy that our nature allows us, but we don't know how close. I mean, we can feel how close we might be getting to the chickadee, but we don't know, in fact, because we're not chickadees. We do not have the subjective experience of a chickadee. I admire the effort to do that. And I think it's really important that people try to do it. And I understand the difficulty of doing that in a way that's convincing and not uh, patronizing or anthropomorphizing or all the other things that might be the risk associated with it. But I think that's, uh, I think that's an admirable effort. I hope you keep at it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um... I'm not seeing any additional questions. Let me just double check. Um, did you have somewhere um, that you wanted to direct people if they wanted to learn more about you and your work? Oh, no, I'm, a, I'm on a University of Virginia website. They can okay. see all my legal publications, but I'm <laughs> not sure how much interesting that would be. Well, I am they inspire poetry that. after they read those. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do write some poetry, which I'm gonna read with others later and um, I am working on a memoir uh, which tries to deal with some of these questions in a more personal way. Um, well, it looks like we're close to, to wrapping up. So thank you, John, so much. Um, and as you mentioned, you will be joining us to read a little bit of poetry, not in our next hour block, but in the one following that. So we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Liz. Thanks everybody for listening. Appreciate it.